Kane Cross once dreamed of helping make dream worlds. Now their real world is being attacked by a mental pandemic. This one strikes as you sleep, sending its victims into dark tunnels of despair to fight for their waking lives. We seek a cure for the Nightmare Virus, the new YA sci-fi fantasy thriller from Nadine Brandis. Speculative fiction, like no other genre, reflects the creativity of God. If you look at the scriptures, you're going to have to see that God uses imagination more than rational discourse. We are supposed to be image bearers for a vastly creative God. Reading fantastical fiction opened a portal in my imagination for a place other than just a materialistic world. I experienced the gospel story with the mind of someone who loved adventure and loved the idea of light conquering darkness. We're wired for stories that reflect how we see the world in ways that are true. The story is either pointing to Christ or it's pointing to our need for Christ. Welcome to the Waking World of Fantastical Truth, the podcast from lorehaven.com in which we explore fantastical stories for God's glory. I'm E. Stephen Burnett, the publisher of Lorehaven and author of a new science fiction adventure novel releasing next year from Enclave Publishing. And I just got back from Realm Makers, and so I've only ever had good dreams since that conference. And I'm Zachary Russell, and I have this recurring dream that is the last day of college, and I completely forgot to attend that one class that I should have been studying for because now it's the final exam and I have no idea what's happening. But thank goodness I'm awake. And this is episode 222. What if you had to fight your own dreams? And yes, we will be talking to Nadine Brandis about her new book, The Nightmare Virus. And I really hope we stay awake. I pinched myself a couple times. I got my coffee. Because, man, I do not want to fall asleep while talking about nightmares that haunt you. I can fantasticalize that tropey dream just a little bit, Zach, by adding these words. And then the dragons attacked. (laughs) I don't remember whether there are dragons in Nadine's book, but there is a a lot of struggle. Uh, There is a lot of difficulty in some of the emotions that you would associate with both nightmares and a pandemic. Very interesting, though, I think, to hear the origins of this story, which we'll be doing in just a moment as soon as Nadine rolls into here. First off, however, we did just get back from Realm Makers, and wow, what an event. Uh, We had the Lorehaven Open World awarded people who completed quests at that booth, and uh, no rest for the weary, however. We're going ahead and preparing for the next Realm Makers conference in 2025. A bigger one this time, a crossover event, and uh, hopefully then, Lord willing, we'll be having a bigger booth with more quests, more prizes, and oh, more books. Because while I'm working on my sci-fi novel, Marion Jacobs is finishing her nonfiction book about the difference between occult magic and fictional magic. Interesting contrast there. Then fantasy and sci-fi, and we're going to see both genres represented in this episode as soon as Nadine gets here. Meanwhile, subscribe free at Lorehaven and join the Lorehaven Guild. Just because we don't have that booth open anymore at the Realm Makers uh, book exhibit doesn't mean you can't uh, undergo these monthly book quests uh, with the best Christian-made fantastical novels in the Lorehaven Guild. I'll share more about that later. But you can also get reviews of the best Christian-made fantastical novels at Lorehaven, including our review posted a few weeks ago, advanced review of The Nightmare Virus. Speaking of which, that is, of course, our top sponsor again for this episode, The Nightmare Virus by Nadine Brandis, uh, just released a few weeks ago, Tuesday before Realm Makers. Some viruses go after the body, but the nightmare virus goes after the mind. When dream technology goes wrong, the virus spreads across the globe, trapping people in a universal dreamscape. They call it the nightmare virus. Kane Cross is determined to find a cure if he can decipher his brother's chicken scratch formula notes. But when he gets infected, he has only 22 days until he's trapped in the mental prison forever. Now, every time he falls asleep, he must fight in a nightmare arena until he earns his freedom to live in the new world that exists only in the mind. Then he finds a way to manipulate the nightmare, to change it by mere thought. Forced to navigate a world of night beasts, mist blades, and half-truths, Cain turns his focus to survival. Will he continue searching for a cure or will he swear allegiance to the nightmare? And the bigger question might be, will he even have a choice? 
This novel comes from Enclave Escape, The Nightmare Virus by award-winning author and today's guest, Nadine Brandis. Available now wherever fantastic books are sold. You can order online or ask for it at your favorite bookseller or local library. Enclave Publishing is a division of Oasis Family Media, our top sponsor. You can see that cool cover, get more info, including the purchase link in our show notes for episode 222, or go to lorehaven.com slash podcast. From there, I hear some uh, squeaky wheels and a very interesting structure rolling in. I'm going to open the bay doors uh, to receive our guest. Nadine Brandis has just rolled into the studio in her tiny house on wheels. She has been known to do wild things like doing that or riding a sleeper train across Russia in the name of book research. She is the four-time Carol Award-winning author of seven young adult books and has been a professional fiction editor for over a decade. She is passionate about Jesus, motherhood, and creating with the Creator. But when she's not busy inventing worlds and magic systems, she is adventuring through Middle Earth with her Auror husband and their four halfling children and lately adventuring into the Lorehaven Studios. Nadine, welcome for the first time. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. Hey, great to have another fan of sleeper trains. I got to do one of those uh, a long time ago. So what, what a cool experience. Very, very cool. I think the last time I rode a train was just some little tourist uh, affair, uh, either in the place I lived before or the place I live now, or perhaps both. But Nadine, I feel like you've been on the show before, but in fact, it was actually our interview a few years ago, back when Lorehaven had a print issue. So I've put that link in our show notes for that interview in 2018 where you said a quote uh, that turned out to be the headline of the interview, quote, I process big questions through story, end quote. So I'd like to start there <laughs> with your origin story before we talk about uh, your new novel, The Nightmare Virus, uh, your origin story. How did you discover biblical truth and fantastic imagination at the same time in any particular order? How did that go for your backstory? Yeah, I'm probably the rare author who didn't plan to be an author. I love writing stories. I never thought about publishing. I never thought about writing books. I just had loved story all my life. And most of my life, I, I've been journaling. And that is how I started writing my first stories. It's just like that quote said, I process big questions through story. And so I would do that in my journals as a teenager, as a young adult through college. And eventually, when I wrote my debut novel, A Time to Die, I pulled so many different quotes or descriptions or themes from those journals that I'd written in, and they became a part of the story. And it wasn't until I finished writing that book that I thought, oh, I, hmm, what about publishing? I guess that's a thing. Maybe I'll look into sharing this story with other readers. And that's kind of when my brain made the shift from just writing stories because I enjoyed them or because they helped me wrap my mind around bigger questions, whether it's about life or about faith or about my own personal journey, that made the shift to actually writing fiction to share with other people. So tell me about these journals. I mean, were they just the standard moleskin or were they the ones with like the lock and key and then you got to hide the key from your, you know, your siblings, your parents or whatever? Was it like That's a diary, thing? not a journal. I think there, there's <laughs> a difference between those. A couple of my kids have those. So. <laughs> <laughs> it depends what age you're asking about. <laughs> I, I, li I lock and key all the teenage drama. <laughs> Nobody needs to read that. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I used to be a big journaler too, but ever since I've had, you know, computers and, and type everything, I actually find it much harder, but but kind of more satisfying to use a handwritten journal. I don't know if you've found the same thing, but I mean, my handwriting is atrocious. And so sometimes I'm like, did I write this? Because I can't even read that. And my kids make fun of me. <laughs> they're like, dad, don't you know good handwriting? We learned this in school. So are, are you still a journaler now, even though you've, you've had some books uh, published? I am. I still journal by hand. And I think I'm on like my 28th or 30th journal or something like that. I don't journal quite as often, but I do still process big questions or big life changes and things like that through journaling. And a lot of it goes hand in hand with prayer and talking to the Lord. And as cheesy as it may sound, I think Christian authors get it that a lot of my inspiration comes from scripture or from, you know, listening to a sermon or my time with the Lord. And that doesn't equal a cheesy Christianese book, but it 
creates the inspiration behind stories from, you know, the creator, the original <laughs> inventor of story and imagination. Oh, there's so much I could say here about the implication that overt biblical themes equals cheesy. They do not, but I'm going to move along from that topic because <laughs> it's probably another episode, probably one we've already done two or three times. But all this talk about journaling always makes me feel a little guilty, as if my journal, old journal, is a sentient being that I surrendered probably back in 2014, 10 years ago. I will say the journalism at the time killed my journaling. There just wasn't enough time uh, for more uh, personal uh, writing like that. And then I got into many other things uh, once I changed jobs. I switched from the handwritten journal to the uh, digital journal, I think, at age 18 when I got a laptop. But I can certainly affirm this idea of sorting through the big questions out loud in writing. And yeah, I think in my case, like journaling also could uh, become uh, an opportunity for ruminating, uh, whereas I, I probably also found a lot more opportunities enjoying the stories by others, exploring some of these themes, not just through my own journey, but through character journeys. So Nadine, I'm curious, what was the switch then, uh, do you think, like the types of books that you enjoyed reading uh, that maybe drew you out into other worlds as well, uh, to the point where you even wanted to start creating your own with A Time to Die? Yeah, I am the cliche reader. I was inspired by all of the Harry Potter, Hunger Games, like the books that inspired everybody. I wish I had the one-off rare book that nobody has really heard of that changed my life. But no, <laughs> I'm just so your standard cliche. Yes, very, very <laughs> much so. But the timing of those books were very important in my life. I read Harry Potter as they came out. I was the same age as Harry with each book that came out. And for me, I found a friend in that story. But there's a story in my life that I'm going to share here if we have the time. When my parents had a rental house. And so we were living in this rental house and there was a locked door in the basement of this house. And we were just told it's locked. It belongs to the owners. Never go in there. Well, of course, me and my siblings, were, we invented all sorts of ideas. What's behind the locked door? And one day I was alone at home. I was a teenager and I found a key on top of a door frame, uh, and I dun, thought, I dun, bet this goes dun. to the locked door. And <laughs> I, you know, do I want to ruin that mystery and find just a room full of, you know, dusty furniture or something? Um, of course I did. So I opened the door and I didn't tell anybody. And inside, floor to ceiling, were stacks and stacks of books, like more books than I could count. Whoa. Fiction, nonfiction, all sorts of things. And so I, because I was, I wasn't the best kid. I didn't tell anybody that I found the key. I would sneak in there and I'd put a pillow under the door so nobody would know the light was on. And I would read books. And that was how I found Tolkien's book. And I would sit there reading Lord of the Rings. And so I had this magical secret room of books that got me reading beyond Harry Potter and beyond just the typical things that I was encountering at school. And it created a love for reading, but also a desire to share that magic of finding a story that felt like it was just for me. That is absolutely spectacular. Wow. And it sounds like too, Nadine, you were reading across multiple genres. Our, our last uh, guest, uh, Jerry Jenkins, who's written, I think maybe 200 books by now has written all across these genres, sports biography, ministry biography, end times, thriller, contemporary romance, historical, just everywhere. Uh, and you too have also written in uh, historical fantasy, dystopian sci-fi, and then uh, the book we'll talk about next, The Nightmare Virus, kind of a combination of some of these. Uh, what leads to your interest in these different types of genres, although, uh, as far as I can tell, uh, always under the label fantastical? Yeah, I, I follow the story. The next story that comes into my head is the one that I want to write. And I was told after um, the Out of Time series, since they were dystopian, I moved on to a different publisher after that series. And that publisher, Thomas Nelson, said, well, you need to stick with that genre. You're going to lose your readers if you hop genres. But I thought, well, I don't, I don't have a story in that genre. The only stories I have are these historical fantasies. Would you like them? So they took a gamble on me, but that put in my head, oh, it's maybe not standard for an author to jump genres. And I think it's a little bit more relaxed nowadays. More authors are realizing that their readers aren't going to abandon them. But for me, it was, I don't want to force a story in a genre uh, just for the sake of genre. 
I'm going to write the stories that I'm excited to write. And I really get stories kind of one at a time. So I can't count that I'm going to have another story after the only one that's in my head. I've got to write it and then see what comes next. And thankfully, I've had publishers who are willing to let me try genre hopping and it's worked. <laughs> and, and the book, you know, my readers don't mind. My readers don't mind. And my publishers have been very supportive in that. Is it genre hopping, though? Uh, when we have the Nightmare Virus uh, coming out uh, listed at the Lorehaven Library, we have three overall genre categories, fantasy, science fiction, and supernatural, which can also include horror, paranormal, uh, or just a contemporary story with some sort of strong miraculous element there. It was difficult to just add a checkbox to the Nightmare Virus because it's got some sci-fi, but then once you're in the Nightmare world, it's a little bit more uh, fan fa fantasy proper in there. Uh, fantasy creatures and magic and lightning bolts and all of these things. So I think a lot of readers maybe are more forgiving uh, because they realize that everything is under that label fantastical. The genre to me, the overarching genre seems to be fantastical or speculative or whatever you call it. Yes, I agree. And we as the authors see it that way. And I do believe our readers see it that way, but not every publisher sees it that way. So depending on who you're talking to, it is genre hopping or it's not. Yeah, well, and you're on social media a lot, so you can communicate to your readers why you're doing this new genre compared to other ones. And so they can say, oh, okay, that makes sense. And then being accessible like that helps make sense that. But I want to go back to the secret room of books. My goodness, what an amazing discovery is a kid. And I want to know, did you ever get caught? I didn't get caught, but I did confess after we moved. So I still never shared it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, cause... I was afraid if I, if I say, Hey, I opened up this door, then I'd be told not to go in again. Or my siblings would rat me out. You know, I had to guard. I was like a dragon and that was my treasure. And so you kept it secret from your siblings as well as your parents. That, that's quite an accomplishment. I mean, I did. I, I'm just struggling to think like if I was a parent in that situation, like would I tell my kid, oh, stop reading those books. What are you doing? That's so silly. I mean, I, I would be like so secretly proud, like, you know, just don't get <laughs> caught again or whatever. But I'm sitting here wondering, like, do my kids sneak into my study and grab a book off the bookshelf and then read it while I'm not here or something, and then put it back in exactly the same spot. Now, I wonder if I should set like little traps to see if they, <laughs> see if if they read reading. certain books. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> hey, Nadine, I'd like you to edit this uh, opening sentence for possibly the way I'll promote this uh, episode on social media. One warm night, Nadine broke into the restricted section. <laughs> hmm. Well, why was it oh, one something, not warm, one... One warm doesn't work. Yeah, it kind of yeah. starts with that same uh, consonant. So, okay, so those first three words need some work. But uh, you breaking into the restriction section is, I, th I think that's a pretty good hook. And obviously, despite the sin that was involved there that needed <laughs> confession later, it led to some good things. Uh, and so finding that light in the midst of darkness, uh, finding that good coming out of bad choices, it's something that our author is extremely skilled at doing. Speaking of authors, though, let's go to our second sponsor, author Jamie Foley, who also has a book coming out. I think this one is clearly labeled fantasy. It is book three in the Katrosi Revolution series. Imagine being able to read Game of Thrones without the guilt. And not everyone has to die. In this epic fantasy quartet, the elementals have decided their gods and humans are fuel for their fire. The Katrosi Revolution series began with book one, Emberhawk. Forward reviews gave this fantasy novel five stars and described it as a heartfelt fantasy whose tinges of darkness don't threaten the endearing relationship at its core. Book two, Silverblood, was the winner of the 2022 Realm Award for Christian Fantasy, and the highly anticipated book three, Lotus Fall, releases August 13. Watch for the cover reveal from author Jamie Foley on Wednesday, July 17. Before then, you can visit amberhawk.com or your local bookstore to get yourself a hardcover, paperback, ebook, or audiobook. Or pre order directly from the publisher at fayettepress.com to get a signed copy and some super sweet swag. That website is amberhawk.com, spelled like it sounds. You can also get the links and uh, see the previous covers in our show notes for episode 222 or at lorehaven.com slash podcast. 
All right, Nadine, new book from you already out. Uh, we just had a party about it at uh, the Realm Makers Conference, Chapter 2. Everyone has dreams, but no one programs them. It's so irritating. Uh, the dreams are almost like this uh, generative content uh, based on the text and image predictions drawn from real life and who knows where. Uh, they jumble together. They look strange. Sometimes people have six fingers on their left hand. But in this case, something different is done with dreams in the world of the nightmare virus. I'm curious what images or themes uh, or ideas came together to help create the origin for this new novel. Well, themes are a big part of how I come up with my story ideas. And this one was very much related to what I'm going to say is probably going to sound very cheesy, but I know that I can say it here and people won't take it that way. I was thinking about how we have this relationship with Christ. We have this answer to what happens at the end of life. And we have the hope, we have the gospel, and Jesus gave us that answer. And how are we treating it as if our time is very short? You'll see a theme through my books with my first trilogy, A Time to Die, and the Out of Time series is very focused on what do we do with the time that we have. And this book was my next idea after that series. And so it was still in that thought process of how are we viewing the time that we have? Our days are numbered. And as a teen, as a young adult, it feels like we have forever, but we don't know the time that we have. And so that translate, you know, that was a big thought for me. And I was processing it through story. What if we were put into another world or another reality where time is literally so much shorter and the nightmare world is much shorter you know there's kind of the the math of the time how does time work differently in the nightmare versus in real life and if we were in a world where we knew that we really only have a couple of years left but we also have the answer to how to survive that world we have the knowledge of the cure how would we interact with our fellow man how would we interact with world that the world how would that change our thinking and that was the big concept, the big theme that sparked the idea for the nightmare virus. So tell me about this dream technology that's in the story. Well, I couldn't tell you how it works. That's proprietary, obviously. <laughs> but it's very similar to Inception, where you can enter a dream. It started out as a, um, you know, a commodity that people wanted to purchase, entering a dream for one reason or another, a different dreamscape for a celebration or just for adventure or things like that and something went wrong. And then now the entire world, every time they fall asleep, once they're infected, they enter into a dreamscape that everybody goes into the same one. It's not all these separate ones. It is just like a an alternate universe, and they can't figure out why that's happening, or who created it, or what went wrong to make this happen. And that's what the main character is trying to solve. But you came up with this idea before we had a different kind of pandemic and lockdowns and all of that about four years ago. Did I hear that right? Yes, I had the idea for this book in 2015. So loud and clear, this is not a COVID book. It never was. <laughs> when when COVID happened, I I thought, well, now I'll never get to write that book. Everyone's going to think it arose from the pandemic or I just figured no publisher is going to want this because it's too close to home or it sounds too similar or it sparks dread in the readers. You know, even just the word virus is on the cover. And we really tried to think of, is there a different title that's going to work better? And there isn't. That was just the best title for the story. So, no, I had the idea far sooner. Well, it's not so much a, a, a virus so, so much as a, an infection in the mind. It's not so much the body but the imagination uh, that is being held captive to these dark images. And I think that that actually is a far more meta an observation about what a lot of people went through during lockdowns and all the, all the mess of it is a lot of these, uh, these hauntings of doom that people had and the despair uh, and the fear of death. I mean, there we go again with the uh, teach us to number our days. You know, there's a time to die and a time to live. Uh, type thinking there from Ecclesiastes, but to remix that again and then to maybe explore that in a different way, I think can only be helpful like people were doing during the lockdowns. Uh, there was a lot of harm done for sure, but there was also, you know, what men meant for evil, God meant for good. And I see that so many people becoming aware of uh, the temporal nature 
of life and the, the flaws of the medical establishment and, and governments and all of this, people were being led to question what they thought was solid and forever. And then they were drawn to realizing, no, there really is evil in the world. And after they realize there's evil in the world, they realize, well, then that means there must be a God. And a lot of people now are reading scripture and being drawn not just to vague deism, but specifically to Jesus and the gospel through this exact blend of appeal to their heads and appeal to their hearts. And so we got little bits of revival going on. And I think that uh, more stories like this, although they're not meant to just get people saved, you know, they're not just evangelism tools, you know, wedge. Uh, it's more about um, baptizing the imagination to start thinking in these terms of light and darkness and dreams and nightmares. And then maybe even this theme from the beginning where you have people uh, uh, arranging their dreams and you know, escaping into this dream world. And then the dream becomes a nightmare from which you must flee. I'm really appreciating that. And uh, we just, by the way, Lorehaven, we just had a review of the nightmare virus. I would hasten to mention that. We'll have that link in the show notes as well. Um, what has been the reaction so far uh, from people who have been uh, blessed enough to get an early peek at the nightmare virus? And it's okay for you to say, because I just asked you about it. <laughs> I've been really pleased with the early reactions. I I was wary at first because this is a very different book than my other books. And I've said that a lot. And readers are either going to lean into that and like it, or they're going to resist it. And it has a very different tone to it. Just there's so much about this book that is different and difference, either good or bad to the reader, depending on their taste. And all, almost all of the early feedback that I've gotten has been very, very positive. A lot of people have said that it's my best book yet, which is blowing me away. I'm very, I'm thrilled that they feel that way. I think that they're connecting with the heart of the book as I hope and as I had prayed. And um, also, I'm really proud of this. A lot of people have said that they're hooked from the beginning, which I'm notorious for having slow beginnings in my book. Slow doesn't mean bad. It's just a different type of story. And most of my readers, they know, okay, I'll commit through a slower beginning and it'll ease into a bigger story. But this one, I think, has my best intro, the best hook, all of the things that I, I hope to do in a book someday. It just didn't fit in my other books. So I've been really encouraged. So the virus in this story sounds kind of like a computer virus, but but sort of like a spiritual or a, like a psychological virus rather than like a biological virus. Am I getting that right? So more like a, a brain worm, I guess is another uh, term for it. <laughs> Maybe you don't want to go with that because that's kind of a weird picture. But then there's a cure that they're trying to find. So, and I'm I'm assuming that that is also not just like, you know, a shot or a pill or, or something medical, but it, it's some other kind of cure. Now, I'm sure you don't want to give spoilers, but can you tell us more about what that search is like to find a cure, to find some kind of solution to this nightmare? Yeah. So the main character and his brother are the ones trying to find a cure. They wanted to be draftsmen, which are people who make the dreamscapes. And so they've kind of been immersed in that world. And when the virus when the nightmare virus comes, they're trying to find a cure using the knowledge they've had of the blend of imagination and being able to program that. And there are specifics that are left vague and left to the imagination, but they are following what they know. And the more they interact with the nightmare, every time they enter into it, when they fall asleep, they're learning, oh, wait, this broke some rules from what I knew. So how does that change how we find a cure? And then the next time they go in, well, this breaks rules that we knew too. So what does that mean? So they're not just trying to find a cure, but they're also trying to even understand that nightmare world that they're in because they're trying to cure something that seems to be changing or inconsistent. They don't necessarily know what the exact problem is to cure it. And that's an internal and external journey of itself. And did you ever have a dream or a nightmare that found its way into this book that you were inspired by? Um, no, but I will kind of go further with that. I used to have chronic nightmares for years and years in my young adult years. Very, very vivid, multiple times a night, lots of different ones. It was different every time. You know, no matter how much I prayed, they wouldn't go away. And through those years of process and growing with the Lord, I started learning, okay, well, what does it mean to trust the Lord when he still allows my imagination to go to these dark places outside of my will? 
that was an interesting journey of faith. And I'm very thankful for it, even though it wasn't pleasant at the time. But learning, well, how do I fight these? How do I combat them through faith when they're still happening? I'm not necessarily defeating them, but I'm still in a battle. And a lot of that carried over into the story. Those themes carried over into the story, but I didn't necessarily put exact dreams or nightmares that I've had into it. Yeah, I I like that whole question of like, how do I trust the Lord in a dream? You know, that's something I've thought a lot about. By definition, you're unconscious, right? So you're you're not awake, but there's still some amount of your will that goes on while you're asleep. And and yeah, like if you've had the really lucid dream or the vivid dream where you're where you're kind of more conscious than you are normally but it's still just in your mind. You're not in real life. You know, is there a moral dimension to that? You know, I I can think of a dream where, you know, I committed a crime. I know I didn't actually do that crime, but I I didn't actually shoot that person in in real life, but I I guess I thought about it or I, I pictured that. So, you know, does that carry over? And then, but then there's also the other side of it. Like if I'm going through something horrible in a nightmare, is there a certain response God is looking for from me? So I like that you were asking that question. I did an article like this uh, about three years ago for Lorehaven about this, where you know you, you think about the decisions that characters in the Bible had to make because of a dream that they had. So it's more about when they were awake, but how God definitely used dreams to prompt them to take action. W- were there any other lessons that you learned from that, that series of dreams that you had? I did know, and this was something that carried over into the book, that when you're dreaming, your emotions tend to be very different than in real life, either heightened or non-existent, you know, committing a crime, but feeling no guilt or something that's nor- that's typically normal, but you're feeling a lot of fear about it. And so I did try and put that into the story when you're in the nightmare world. How are your emotions? Are they out of control? And There were times in my dream where I could tell whether or not I had the awareness or the the mental control to make a decision. But then there were times when I'd wake up from a dream and I knew that everything, my reactions in that dream were completely out of my control. So there were kind of different layers of what control I had, how much I could tap into my, my morals or decision making and change that. So that confusion that came or the inconsistency that came was something that I had to find peace with. And that was another spiritual journey that I journaled a lot through and talked with the Lord about and came to a place of peace and being able to let those go when I'm outside of dreaming. Sometimes I have this dream doc and in the dream, I'm Spider-Man. No, no, it's not my dream. It's a friend of mine's dream. (laughs) The scene from (laughs) Spider-Man 2, which I thought was hilarious because at the time I'd been having a lot of Spider-Man dreams. By the way, I think uh, this could unlock a whole unexplored dimension of the predestination versus free will debate. Do we have actual free will in dreams, even lucid dreams, or is this just an illusion? But that's for another episode. (laughs) We just had a celebration for uh, the nightmare virus uh, at Realm Makers, and we also had the Lorehaven Open World booth where we met uh, so many people, including listeners to this podcast. And we promoted our uh, new little slogan called Made by Humans. And that's one thing I appreciate about every guest that we have on this episode when we're exploring their stories is that they are exploring their own stories and others from this deeply human perspective. We want to encourage you to keep doing that with the Lorehaven Guild. That is our exclusive community on Discord, our castle in the cloud, where we engage monthly book quests through the best fantastical Christian-made novels that we can find. But you can only join the guild if you subscribe free to Lorehaven Updates, which you can do at lorehaven.com. Just look for the pop-up and enter your email, and then we will send you the secret code to join the Lorehaven Guild. We're having more members uh, join there now after the conference, and we're going to talk about the Nightmare Virus and all kinds of other books, the best ones that we can find. Lorehaven.com, subscribe free, and join the guild. Next up, Nadine, I mentioned that dreams help us forecast the future, so we always like to get uh, as many predictions as we can, if possible, for the third chapter of an interview like this one, uh, the futures of reality and fantastical world. So the nightmare virus is out, but this is an idea that for you has been sticking around for eight or nine years. So I'm very curious, before we even talk about maybe what's next for you, uh, you've been at this now 
for quite a long time, starting with the, the Out of Time series with Enclave. And now you're back of doing stuff with Enclave. But what are some of the uh, growth signs that you've seen in the genre? You've already mentioned, for example, about authors maybe being a little bit more free uh, if they have faithful readers to be trusted, to try some dystopian, to try some fantasy. I mean, your last novel was called Wistress, you know, so not a whole lot of uh, dream viruses going on there. But what are some uh, predictions, patterns maybe, uh, that you might dare to make about the Christian fantastical world as a whole? I think that the desire for these types of books is growing more and more. When I was first published with the Out of Time series, Christian fantastical books were fewer and further between than they are now. And now it's become accepted. It's not just, oh, those weirdos over there who write that. It's like, okay, maybe they're weird, but maybe I'm a little bit weird too. Or maybe I like to read weird or I'll recommend weird because it's got Christian themes or it's from biblical worldview. And I think that there's a hunger in readership for stories that stretch our imagination and help us grow in that way while also still, I hate using the word clean because everybody interprets that differently, but wholesome. you know, con- wholesome, wholesome content. I love wholesome. <laughs> there we go. Yes. Having more wholesome content or themes that draw us back to the Lord, or that if we just want to read it for entertainment, it's wholesome entertainment. So I think that it's growing and we're seeing it grow for a reason. I think in the future, it's going to grow even more. So demand is even stronger. I think our world, much of our world seems to be going in two extreme directions. There's the futuristic, let's invent as much as we can, as fast as we can, and and follow that rabbit. Or they're the people who are trying to step back to a slower way of life. And a lot of those people tend to enjoy slow things like reading, the things that we picture equaling a calm day, or you're sitting and you're growing your mind. And I think growing your mind can happen in both of those extremes. But I do see kind of a rift happening in our culture and our society, people choosing one of those two ways. And I think reading is something that still exists in both of those paths. And the demand for them is going to come strong onto Christian publishing. And so if you're a Christian writer, now is the time. Now is definitely the time. Yeah, I I definitely think we are living in a a time where we are, like you said, we're very split over technology because we, (laughs) technology is inescapable, but, but maybe a dystopian version of it is escapable. You know, it's, it's not inevitable. I was in some conversations this weekend about key fobs, for example, (laughs) like how it it used to just be a key that you'd have for your car, right? You could have extra copies of it. You could you could even keep one in your wallet or you could keep one of those little magnetic boxes you put under your car. And then along came the key fob. And it did all had all these buttons, did all these things. You could even start your car remotely with it. Uh, but of course, it has a battery. And that battery runs down. So, well, we need a better solution. So how about an app that you keep on your phone? Well, maybe I leave my phone at home or something. So I've got my watch. I've got my smart watch. So that's always going to open my car. And it's just like, Every step, it's like almost like unnecessarily complicated, but it's like a solution to the previous technology that was not complicated enough, I guess. And so (laughs) this is only going to accelerate. There's no slowing this down. We are going to live in a world that's just increasingly complicated. And I like books like this that show, hey, there's a technology that's going to take over the world. It's literally going to take over your dreams and your mind. And here's how it's going to go wrong. But here's what people are going to do about it. To me, that's sort of comforting because it's in a weird way. Like I'm very comforted by dystopian stories where they're, I'm assuming there's a happy ending. I mean, it's a Christian worldview. So we, we kind of have that built into our worldview, but it's where we can see, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, God is going to be there with me. Even though I might live through this crazy dystopian cyberpunk world, whatever you want to call it, like there is a way through it. I think that's really the, the most comforting thing you can do rather than like, just look back. Ah, oh, what if all the technology went away? Like, I don't think it's ever going away, but there's going to be a way that we find through it. I'm looking forward to more and more stories like this. I, I think we're increasingly living in a sci-fi world. You know, I grew up loving fantasy and now I'm, I'm switching more to sci-fi because there were these viral commercials from AT&T back in the 1990s. It's like, can you imagine a time where you could check out any book in the world from a computer? <laughs> And can you imagine a world where you can get on a payphone and see your loved ones on a screen? And it's like, okay, 
is first of all, it's funny that you have to go to a library to get a digital book. And second of all, you have to go to a payphone. Like they, it's like they couldn't imagine a world where payphones didn't exist. <laughs> that whole vision of the future, it seems so, so kitschy and aha, that, that'll never happen. And now it has happened. And now it's increasingly happening. You know, just this week, uh, SpaceX announced that they've had five launches already in four weeks, I think, of their latest uh, rocket. And so I like that you are focusing the reader on that, like, we're entering this fast-paced world, but in a book, you can take the slow path through thinking about it. You know, not not mm-hmm. avoiding it, not g- going back to ye old times, but how can we live through this time as a Christian? So I, I hope to see more of this from a lot of authors. I think that's a great perspective. Well, I like both sci-fi and fantasy. I, I think we all do. And Nadine, we just recently had this kind of fake war with the enclave authors and incoming enclave authors over the summer about the sci-fi versus fantasy. And I'm convinced that 100% of the participants were feeling like a double agent this whole time. <laughs> Because I don't think anyone is just a complete sci-fi or fantasy partisan. Did you take a side in that? Could you even take a side in that? I mean, I was kind of kidnapped onto the sci-fi side. And I feel like even with Nightmare Virus, like you said, there are definitely fantasy elements. My editor and I call my book Science Fantasy because it's so in the middle. You know, I tried to keep the peace as much as I could. <laughs> right. Well, it's not uh, just a, a squishy position. It It is a biblical position <laughs> there's <laughs> elements of fantasy and sci-fi in almost every story and sci-fi likes to play around with fantasy and the fantasy likes to play around with sci-fi although it does seem that for example star trek can have a complete fantasy episode within sci-fi constraints whereas if you put phasers into your medieval castle it uh, seems a lot stranger so maybe one can get away with it more than the other uh, but I asked for predictions earlier the nightmare virus is out uh, do you have any uh, story ideas announcements you wish uh, to leak uh, going into 2025 and beyond on your part? I have nothing that I can leak, but I can say something's coming. Okay. And I'll have to leave it at that. I'm sworn to secrecy. Yeah, heard it here first, folks. Breaking news, breaking news. Something <laughs> is coming. And you can take that to the bank. There's just, That's unfalsifiable. Wonderful to know. Wonderful to know. Well, Nadine, it's been great having you. The Nightmare Virus out everywhere. Uh, you can get the hardcover, you can get the audiobook, all of that. Uh, where can folks uh, keep track of the something that is coming, as well as the stories that you've already made in fantasy, sci fi, and everywhere in between? Yeah, my website, nadinebrandis.com, but I'm most active on Instagram and through my email newsletter. Um, if you want to make sure that you don't miss any announcements, my newsletter is the place to be. And it wouldn't hurt to follow my publisher on Clay Publishing. Yeah, or if you can find Nadine's journal and you you have the secret key that goes into the lock, you know, maybe you can find <laughs> out some more information. You'll find a portal. <laughs> I just want to know if there's space in the tiny house uh, for a restricted section, because I understand uh, a lot of folks living in tiny houses have to go for electronic books, and I hope you'll always keep a secret space for physical print tiny copies house just for the books yeah yeah oh, so maybe yeah. it's uh, bigger on the inside you know there you go now it's kind of <laughs> fantasy and sci-fi at the same time nadine thank you so much for stopping by and godspeed with the nightmare virus and every other story you create thank you so much for having me Stephen, that was so interesting to hear Nadine point out how when you're dreaming, your emotions tend to be very different. You don't feel the things you think you should feel, or you feel things that you can't quite explain. They, they seem a little out of place. And when we wake up, you try to make sense of that. We've talked about dreams in the Bible a little bit. There's an article I wrote that you can go check out in the show notes. Something I'm very fascinated by right now, and this is more so in my day job, is people from the Middle East who have dreams and visions of Jesus or other things that lead them to Jesus. And I'm actually working on a little project of my own to try to capture those stories uh, because there is something very powerful about the way that God can speak to people through their dreams. And I don't totally understand the rules of that, but it does seem to be very common among people from the Middle East. I've, I've heard up to one half of people that become Christians from that background have had basically supernatural dreams. And so to you, our listener, I've, I've always wanted to hear from other people. Were there dreams you had that you are convinced were from the Lord that, that lined up with something in scripture, 
that led you to some act of repentance or that helped you make some big decision in your life? Were you ever a draftsman, as Nadine said, where you took control of a dream and you started having a lucid dream where you could fly or you could you know, do whatever you wanted, but you knew you were asleep? Or have you had reoccurring nightmares and you had to figure your way through that? So send us a note about any of these topics, podcast at lorehaven.com, or you can also comment on our episode page at lorehaven.com or find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Next on Fantastical Truth, then the Lord said to Joshua, stretch out the javelin that is in your hand toward AI, for I will give it into your hand. Well, there you have it, straight from Scripture, clear biblical evidence to oppose artificial intelligence, right? Well, at the same time, many people do see advantages to these tools, including but not limited to the generative AI tools. But how can we celebrate the virtue of stories made by humans? We just had some amazing conversations about that at Realm Makers. In light of our new hashtag, along with buttons and book stickers that we just launched at Realm Makers called Hashtag made by humans. We're going to explore that next week as you are enjoying stories made by humans. I hope that you also have good dreams. I hope that they reflect uh, the peace and goodness and joy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I don't care that it sounds cliche. He is the giver of all good dreams, and sometimes he even brings them to life. We look forward to that uh, ultimate enjoyment as we are staying awake and continuing to seek and find his fantastical truth.